Um, so speaking with Eric, um, he thought it would be good to maybe bring everyone up to speed from where we began with the West Kennebec Lakes Group back in January of 2019 um, is when my involvement started. So I'm going to sort of rapidly go through the last two years of effort. Um, stop me at any time and ask questions. Um, and I, I'm assuming that everyone has probably read through the broadband study for the West Kennebec Lakes uh, project. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to touch on that in uh, sort of a highlight way, if you will. So, um, so first of all, who is Casco Bay Advisors? Um, and I wanted to just spend uh, a couple of minutes. Our focus is working with municipalities and county governments. We do some work for service providers uh, in network planning, engineering, and uh, analysis, but probably 60% of our business is working for municipalities. And we do all facets of these type of projects from the initial feasibility study, which is what I would call that report that we produced for the West Kennebec Lakes Group, uh, market analysis, planning, design, and engineering, um, uh, construction management, uh, helping to facilitate public-private partnerships. Um, we sort of do everything soup to nuts, but we don't build networks and we don't operate networks, um, which is a, a, an important distinction. Um, so we're, we're technology agnostic. Um, we don't recommend a, a, a technology. We're not trying to sell anything. Um, our role, if we're selling anything, we're selling our ability to assist communities um, who are dealing with these challenges to make sure that they have uh, the industry experience and knowledge on their side of the table. Um, so uh, think of us as an advocate or an advisor to municipalities. Um, my background, um, I got into the telecom business in 1984, the year they broke up the bell system. And I've worked uh, in the long distance industry initially um, through all facets, uh, primarily on the competitive side of the business, but uh, also um, uh, spent three years uh, working for Fairpoint, the predecessor to Consolidated Communications. Um, half of my career has been in engineering and operations, and the other half has been in sales leadership and general management. And for the last eight or so years now, going on nine, I've uh, been consulting. Um, uh, to state government, um, uh, uh, counties, and municipalities. So before I move on, any questions about Casco Bay, what our role is, and what my background is? All right. So um, the West Kennebec Lakes Community Broadband Association, um, the we started that project or began talking with the town of Fayette initially um, back in January of 2019. Um, the study that they engaged us to produce was partially funded, but not fully funded when we kicked it off. So as you read through that report, it's broken into a phase one and a phase two. That was really around the available funding to perform the study. Uh, so we sort of split it up. Um, that study included a field audit uh, at a high level. What we were trying to understand was where is the existing infrastructure 
in each of those six towns. Um, and uh, when I talk about existing infrastructure, I'm talking about um, the cable TV infrastructure, uh, charter spectrum uh, doesn't provide maps of their infrastructure. So we go out, we drive every road and long driveway I'm trying to identify the homes that are served by that infrastructure. Um, so it's sort of a quick run through of the community. You know, it takes about two days to drive out a community and make notes. And then we brought that back in house, input all of that into our GIS mapping. Um, and again, this is at a high level. This is desk desktop exercise at this point. Um, and we're not necessarily looking for the actual um, pole lines. Um, we're really just driving roads and driveways looking to so see who's served and who's not. Um, and then we, we present that in the mapping information that you've seen um, that illustrates the road segments that are served and those that are unserved. Um, and then with that data, we then know, uh, oh, it, um, we also plot all of the uh, potential subscriber locations. And uh, the way that we do that is we uh, import the 911 data from the state of Maine that gives us um, a geographic point and an address. But what we also find is that in many communities, that data is not accurate. Um, either it's not spatially accurate or they don't have a 911 address for every uh, potential subscriber location. So we examine, we overlay the 911 data um, over the um, imagery and we search for locations that are likely potential subscribers that don't have an address associated with them. Um, so we went through that process and for Reed Field, in total, we identified 1,248 potential subscriber locations. Now, there's a little bit of a uh, potential error uh, in that process. So think of it as a 95, 98% accurate process. Um, it does not identify multi-tenant unless it's obvious from the aerial imagery or the 911 data. So there could actually be more subscribers there than what we've recorded. Um, so once we have that in the GIS system, then we know the distance of all of these road segments. Um, we know how many subscribers, and then we can start associating subscribers to served areas or uncabled areas. We also captured the, um, uh, the incumbent telephone companies' uh, fiber assets, not their copper assets, but wherever they have fiber, we noted that in the system. It's an interesting uh, point of reference but it really doesn't factor into any of our analysis. Um, so we completed that report and then we reached out to all of the potential service providers that provide service in the state of Maine. And I think I've captured all, all of them here on this chart. Um, the, the first thing we do is talk to the cable company and the phone company. Um, whenever you're trying to fill gaps in coverage or you want to upgrade uh, the capability, the lowest cost solution is always going to be either the incumbent phone company or the incumbent cable company. They already have infrastructure there that can be leveraged. They're already on most or all of the poles um, so that's the first place we go. Um, in this case, um, Charter and, and uh, CCI uh, were non-responsive and weren't really interested in talking. Um, GWI 
Pioneer Broadband, Axiom, LCI, they all had an interest, but it wasn't clear to them what the goals and vision were for this six town group. Um, so their message back was solidify on your goals and visions. If it's gonna be the same for the six towns, great. If it's gonna be different, identify that, but they really needed to know what it is that the towns were, were trying to solve for. Uh, we did speak with Red Zone Wireless. Um, we, uh, we actually took a group of folks to their headquarters in uh, Rockland. Um, and the reality from their perspective is there's not nearly enough uh, towers in this region to effectively provide um, ubiquitous coverage uh, with a wireless service, at least at this point. Um, and then Matrix, Matrix is a company based out of New Jersey that has done a lot of uh, build out in Vermont and Massachusetts. Um, they have a program where um, they're interested in uh, communities that don't have cable TV infrastructure. So they actually put together a proposal for the towns of Fayette and Vienna uh, because there is no cable infrastructure there with the exception of a small area of Fayette. One moment, two. And uh, we had them go back and modify their proposal to include <clears throat> some adjacent areas to those two communities in Mount Vernon, a little bit in Reedfield, Wayne, and Leeds. Um, and their proposal, the service pricing is uh, mm -hmm. a little bit high, uh, but they fund 70% of the project and they expect the towns to pay for all of the utility pull make ready and then the ongoing pull license fees on an annual basis and any uh, space and power for a central office. Um, so that, that proposal is still live, it's on the table. Um, they were supposed to come back and provide a proposal for all six towns, uh, whether they were served by cable or not. Um, and we've not seen that. So um, that was sort of the work with the West Kennebec Lakes Group and um, the way that we left it, and I know the, the towns are still meeting, um, trying to figure out what their strategies are. Um, and then in the meantime, Reedfield uh, individually approached me to talk about um, a potential municipal owned fiber network. So um, at that point, I recommended that before you go down that path, let's put together a financial performa, make sure that you understand how this would perform financially uh, or sustainably and uh, look at it through the lens of different levels of uh, take rate or market share, um, look at it in different ways in terms of uh, service pricing and then uh, as well as uh, um, your debt financing and so forth. So um, that is sort of uh, where we are right now. Um, I'll just point out on this chart, I pulled this table out of the West Kennebec Lakes uh, report um, and we identified uh, that all but 83 potential subscribers in Reedfield had access to the cable TV infrastructure. And uh, that's about 4.8 miles the way that we measured it. Um, and what we've seen with uh, Charter Spectrum in other municipalities they typically cost their construction around $45,000 per mile. Now, that's not what you pay. Um, they will share in that cost and it varies depending upon the density of those build outs. So 
Um, I saw one the other day where the density was eight homes a mile and they were asking the community to cover $37,000 per mile. Um, in others, I've seen it go as low as 40% of that amount. So it just really varies depending on the specific situation um, in that town. So I just used the $45,000 there. Um, the rest of that chart are just uh, estimates um, based on if you have uh, 66.8 miles, assuming there's 33 poles a mile, there's 2,200 poles. This is, that's not a scientific estimate. That's just using what we've seen as averages in other projects. Um, your situation won't be 33, it'll be something less or something more, probably something less. Um, the same route with the, the make what it cost per poll. We use um, a lot of historical averages, um, the backbone construction, all of this information is based on other projects. Um, and then we added in a 10% project management, a 10% contingency. Um, so you're really looking at somewhere between, at the time we put this together, between 4 million and 4.8 million um, for a network. So the intent of that was just to really illustrate how big is the pie? What's, what's the total potential here? Recognizing that that's not an engineered solution, that's a desktop solution at this point. So any questions on this? The, uh, Pat, uh, the project management fee and contingency, uh, which rolls up, you know, adds to the four million to four point eight. I think in the pro forma, um, does not factor in four point eight, right? Yeah, uh, just keep in mind this was the estimate that we put together as part of the West Kennebec Lake study, right. okay. real high level. When we move over, I'm going to show you a couple other slides where specifically with Reedfield, then we started spending more time trying to identify what those costs are. So don't, um, you know, it's evolved. Um, there isn't, don't use this as a basis. Yeah, good first pass though. Right. So. Um, Brian, may I ask a yeah. question? Certainly. I think I already know the answer, but I want everyone else to know the answer. Um, when you put out that proposal for the six town coalition and we got responses back from virtually no one other than Matrix, and there was an update on that today to Vienna. Um, what, was there any interest by anybody in working with Reedfield specifically? Um, Reed, the, the problem with Reedfield is you have significant cable TV infrastructure coverage already, which means that the, the cable company is going to be a significant competitor to whoever would come in. So it has less interest on the part of other providers. Um, that is evolving. There's more and more providers are learning that they can effectively compete against the cable company. Um, but when we went through this process, that was largely the viewpoint is that um, uh, Fayette and Vienna were looked really good because you could go in there and, and probably get 80% market share. But when you're competing against the cable company, um, you're probably, if you're doing a good job, you should be able to achieve 40% um, or higher, uh, but you're not gonna go in and get 80% of the market share. Recognize that the cable companies are the 10,000 pound gorillas. This is an unregulated industry. They have the pricing power um, they can be formidable competitors. Um, and at the end of the day, your subscribers vote with their wallet. How much is coming out of it on a monthly basis? Um, so um, 
you know, there's a lot of opportunity in Maine right now in areas that are unserved, um, where these providers are focusing more. They're focusing um, in these unserved areas because they're eligible for um, public subsidies, either from the state and now the federal government. Um, uh, so Reedfield, you know, when we look at um, the grant dollars opportunities for Reedfield, essentially you could go to the state of Maine and get a subsidy for 83 potential subscribers. And if that subsidy was $2,000 per subscriber, you're looking at $160,000. That's a rounding error right now in the pro forma. Um, so don't, we probably need to, um, you know, level set right away is that there's not subsidies available for Reedfield the way that the rules are currently written. And then there was a meeting that was held with, I think one representative or maybe two from each town with Matrix where uh, you, Matrix took questions and did a small presentation of that proposal that they came back with for Fayette and Vienna. Um, and at that time, I believe we had asked you to ask and you did, and they were, I believe this was the answer that Matrix would be very willing to come and put a network in Reedfield um, to build it and then operate it for us, but it would not be funded at all by them. That's correct. Now, interestingly, um, they just bid on a RFP for some towns that are 95% covered with cable. Really? Uh, yes. Now, but those towns um, have uh, an average of 50 subscribers per mile. Um, at best, you have 20 per subscribers per mile. So that's a whole different economic business case for Matrix. Um, but again, like I said, this, this business is evolving almost on a monthly basis anymore. Um, uh, you know, all of the service providers, their strategies are changing. Um, COVID, I think, had a huge impact on um, their vision for the opportunity in the future that they're going to be able to get more subscribers. And then, of course, all of the public funding that is coming about partially as a result of COVID. So um, th th this has been a game changer in that regard. So um, um, my last question then, because I don't want to hog everything here. Uh, you said that Reedfield has four point something miles that are not served by cable. Now, do you mean that there's cable running down roads partially or do we have complete roads that are not served or is this that the cable is on the road but it's not running to those homes so if you look at this map the light green areas don't have cable or at least didn't when we did the analysis so this was back in 2019 um and i can just turn off that uh, that might stand out a little bit better for you. Um, there's not a lot of areas that don't have cable. Okay, so this is cable running down the road. It doesn't mean that every home but, is, is no, subscribing. No, it stops. So there's, there's no cable on these road segments. Okay, but on the other roads, it doesn't mean that every person is subscribing just because the cable's running down the road. That's correct. That's correct. And it it doesn't mean that people have adequate service, meaning that they can do the things that they desire to do. Um, the, we, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to say exactly what their market share is 
Charter doesn't share the number of subscribers it has in a town, but generally, if they're competing against DSL and, um, and they're the only other game in town, they're probably going to have 70 to 80% market share um, on the roads that they serve. Um, as to whether or not they're providing adequate service, um, that's in the um, eye of the subscriber. And, um, you know, for instance, and I think I've shared this numerous times, I'm a Charter Spectrum customer. I take their standard service and it is sufficient for my needs. And I'm running my business out of a home office. Um, uh, but there's just me and my wife here. And, um, you know, but for us, it, it works well. Um, um, I can't say what the experience is in, um, in Reedfield. Um, there's, you know, we hear all the time that they're not providing the speeds that they've advertised, that it's not as reliable as people would like. Um, and the uh, subscribers don't want to deal with the cable company because they provide the worst customer service, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, um, you know, that's really, it's, it's the, pardon me, I'm going to just, I got to go let this dog out. Hold on. Patrick, I, I think I have a question for you. I think at our last meeting, you had said something about um, cable companies certainly have the ability to provide the same service all the way down a road. So yes. if, if they're not, there's an issue with the cable company. It's not a fault of the type of system. Is that correct? Yeah, if it's engineered properly, and you know, again, I can't say whether or not this is engineered properly. I read through the franchise agreement. I don't see where they're required to provide network maps, uh, but there is a quality of service section that uh, where the town or subscriber uh, can request an engineering study, and there's some SLAs around that, uh, as well as some deliverables. But end of the day, if it's engineered properly, whether you're end of line or front of line, the quality of service shouldn't be any different. I will say, just to add to some of Brian's points, that some of the uh, ability to do the things that people want to do, you're going to have to try and dissect those customers that are on DSL versus cable, because chances are, if they're on DSL, they're going to be limited, um, particularly on the upstream, but I mean, even on the downstream nowadays. Um, but with what Spectrum's providing as packages and the tests I've done in, in my place in Refield, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm doing Zoom calls all day, uh, multitasking, downloading gig files. It seems to be pretty reliable, but that doesn't mean that's the case everywhere uh, in Refield. And, and then there's the subscriber factor, right? So quality of service that a customer is experiencing could also have to do with some of their, uh, you know, internal wiring and maybe not spectrum related. And that's what that whole engineering uh, study in the franchise agreement uh, is really designed to uh, address. And is that something the town can demand because yeah. it's part of the agreement? Yeah, it's in the agreement. A representative, uh, you know, can be from the town can be engaged. I'd be happy to do that. Um, I'd love to see their network maps and see how this thing is designed. Um, but end of the day, everything is fixable if it's engineered correctly and maintained correctly to specification. And do they have an obligation under that franchise agreement to make it engineered correctly? Uh, it does, as I read you know, it. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree with that. Um, only from the perspective that the franchise agreement is for cable TV service. It's not for internet service. So you have no leverage with them on the internet side. I will agree that the hybrid fiber coax architecture 
is very, very capable if it's engineered correctly and if it's maintained and operated correctly. Um, but just, I want to put that differentiation out there. As, yeah, yeah, fair point, Brian, you're absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> you might be able to get them to uh, respond under that provision, under good faith, but you're absolutely right. Franchise agreements uh, only regulate video. Which is really blurred today because a lot of video goes over uh, in ones and zeros <laughs> over IP. Because I know one of this isn't logical. It's you know, <laughs> it's, it's just how the industry has evolved. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know one of the things, Brian, and I'm not trying to change the focus here, but I know one of the questions that we had that I think you can give us insight, especially with Patrick here, um, because you're both very involved in this, is why would Reedfield not just finish the town with the DSL and what would the cost be for that and what guarantee, which sounds like there's none, would we have that everyone would have service? They might not like their customer service, um, but they would still, we could solve the equity issue, which is getting it to everyone. Yeah, it, and that's why, you know, in the, um, uh, the West Kennebec Lakes report, we, you know, our, one of our top recommendation was reach out to the local cable provider, find out what it's going to cost to build out uh, to those unserved areas and get 100% coverage. In this case, Charter was non-responsive. Um, and that wasn't specific to Reed Field. They've been um, incredibly non-responsive sort of across the state. They are starting to provide uh, quotes back to um, towns, but it's a slow, slow process. And they'll acknowledge that. Um, I've had requests into them for nine to 12 months and have not gotten um, responses. And are those requests because do you think their slow response time is because they think they're being asked to fund the project and recoup it through subscriber fees? No, no, no. They're, uh, they're specifically told that the town understands that these road segments don't have the density to require you to build out under the franchise agreement and that the towns are willing to provide a subsidy they just need to know how much that subsidy is going to be, and then they'll then they'll figure out how they're going to fund it. Um, and, and that's that's taking place all over the state. Right? So that wouldn't necessarily be a quicker solution. I mean, I was thinking of sort of a one-two punch where maybe we could build out the DSL to the rest of the service area. Not don't use DSL. Yeah, um, no, DSL. Sorry. It, it, is, the difference. Okay, is it, DSL the dial-up thing? DSL uh, is consolidated service. Never um, mind. <laughs> right. Um, right. The cable. Um, right. And then the second, you know, and then take a slightly longer term approach to bringing the fiber in. Um, but it's not sounding like that would be any quicker because of the time they're taking to respond to anything. I, if you're going to decide to build your own fiber network, you're looking at at least 18 months from the time you say go. Um, so um, the cable company ought to be able to do it in say nine to 12 months. Um, you know, they, they're, they have to deal with the same utility pole issues as you do um, because they're not already on them. So that's an automatic six month um, process six to uh, six to eight month process. So it uh, it it should be quicker, um, but you know, yeah, it's uh, um, they would have to actually respond to a request first, so that we could negotiate something and figure out how to fund right. it, and then we start with the six to 12 months. Right. Okay. I'm good. Yeah. Hey, Brian, I got a, I got a question for you. Um, thanks for, thanks for doing this, by the way, this is very helpful. And it looks kind of like 
the fiber to the home high level estimate is going to be a bridge too far. But um, can you can you go back and, and talk about Reed Field's eligibility for grants is pretty low, and I, you shot up a number like two thousand bucks per customer. But if we got like eighty three customers, that's one hundred and sixty six thousand dollars. And if it's potentially just if that could happen. And then four and a half or 4.8 miles at $50,000 ish per mile is 240. So that, that means somebody else has got to come up with 74,000. That doesn't seem too crazy. No, no, no. Yeah. If, if you're talking grants just for your unserved areas to extend the cable TV infrastructure, all of that is eligible. And that would be $160,000 that would offset a portion of that 214, I think because the average uh, subscribers per mile for your unserved is about 17, that the cable company would probably agree to fund 60% of that 214,000. Yeah, well, I would also argue, given the map that you showed, Brian, which is really helpful, is the unserved areas I would consider minor extensions. Uh, they're very relatively short. Uh, they're very rural. So chances are make ready isn't going to be as much of a factor as it might be on, on your main roads. Uh, and the cost per mile, because of short extension, probably isn't going to require them to add fiber, add nodes, and so forth. They can just extend off their existing plant, which has a lower cost per mile because they're leveraging their existing infrastructure. So that 214 may actually be a little, a little high at the end of the day. But you know, without doing the actual design uh, you know, work uh, and building material, you wouldn't know. But I, I think it's coming under that 214. Yeah, we, we routinely see even on those shorter segments where they will claim they need to go back and overbuild existing infrastructure to extend fiber and they add that into the project. Yeah, yeah, and, certainly. yeah. Yeah, and so you, you don't know until they engineer it and they come back for a, with a price for it. And so- I think that's a fair estimate. You know, 45,000 a mile, I think is right in the ballpark. Uh, and, and that's just based on what we've seen from them elsewhere. And it, again, it can vary. You know, they, they send their crew out, they realize, you know what, on this, on this run, there is no make ready. Um, and then they'll come in with a lower price. So anyways, I'll uh, move on here. This was sort of a refined costing for a fiber to the home network, putting in more thought and it's at 3.8 million before you add in any contingency um, but again to be clear you don't really know until you go out and you capture every pole location and you build a strand map and you really can measure the infrastructure that's going to be required and then you can start having a finer estimate, but even then you don't know until you go out to RFP as to what the costs are going to be because materials are, you know, inching up, um, supply of materials is low because this is taking place worldwide. <laughs> um, uh, so there's, there's a lot of variables. And, and so the the thought process around engineering a plan to develop an RFP with a full bill of materials and it allows you to go out to bid and get competitive bids to see what would this really cost. Um, and then, but even then, you don't know until you get the make ready estimate back from the poll owners. Yeah. And in order to do that, you have to go through a process um, of submitting or you know, negotiating agreements, submitting applications, doing a joint ride out with the poll owners. There's a lot of labor that goes into that. And this estimate is not just for 
their costs that they're going to charge you to do that, but to have somebody managing that make ready process for you. Um, and then you would, you know, you go through the make ready quoting process, you go through the engineering and RFP process, you can get to a number then that is a firm number. Um, and right now we're saying that's going to be, you know, 3.8 million. Um, some of this work can be done concurrently. Um, so while you're doing the engineering, you can be pursuing the PUC certification, the pole attachment agreements. You get your field data collected. You can start submitting applications. There are some things you can do in parallel there. But then you see here, make ready takes six months. You might be able to do some construction of 60 days ahead of time, but it's, it's a serial process after that. So that's why it takes from start to finish 18 months, um, plus or minus. And there is no SLA from the poll owners as to, uh, you know, the, the completion requirement. There, there is, there's uh, there is SLAs within the pole attachment agreements and the PUC governs that with, uh, it's called chapter 880. Oh, that's uh, to complete the actual make ready work itself? Yeah, but there's all kinds of loopholes that allow that to get extended. And it's a laborious process. If you make an error on the application, it's rejected, you start over, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a pretty process, <laughs> so. <laughs> Excuse me, could someone tell us what SLA means, please? I'm sorry, service level agreement. So in other words, if you, know, you have to pay them in advance for the whole attachment utility work that they're going to perform typically, they've got to be prepaid. And then uh, they don't have, they're not gonna give you a, a an SLA as to how long it's going to take them to complete that process to Brian's point. All it takes is one storm or, you know, an act of nature or a whole list of other things where they can extend their time to, to actually complete the work. And to Brian's point, it's a very challenging, laborious process. Six months would be short, in my experience. And yeah, Brian, yeah. when you're talking about us doing this, you I want to be clear to the public and to all of us. We're not talking about the town of Reedfield is going to do this or oversee this. We would hire a company who does all of this. Yeah, yeah. And, and the way that we laid this out is you would hire a owner's project manager. That project manager represents the town of Reedfield and essentially manages the whole project um, manages that make ready process, um, uh, oversees construction, does all of the inspections, uh, works with a network operator to get everything operating. Um, the town itself doesn't do it. It contracts out to have that work done. Thank you. Um, all right. And Actually, this next slide just shows the division of responsibility. This was in another presentation that I had provided. Um, and, you know, you're really, you're still in the first line up here. <laughs> so um, lots of other work to get done, but this is how we envision it. This is how we've done it in other communities. It's sort of a common model. Um, um, but you know, it can, it can vary. Uh, everything is custom customizable. I'm not going to go through all of this with you right now, because I know that you wanted to get into the pro forma. So is that okay that we move there? All right. So for the financial pro forma, the concept is this is a five year projection and, and anybody that thinks they can forecast five years in advance um, is probably, I, if I could, I wouldn't be in this business. I'd be in the stock market. Um, the, but you, tr you do your best and you try to make sure you're conservative and you build in 
a number of different sensitivities into that analysis so that you can exercise the model. So this is a five-year forecast with revenue projections, with the sensitivities on the pricing and the market share, looking at all of the operating expenses and how those scale either with uh, subscribers or inflation or not. Um, it's trying to capture all of the expenses, the debt service and so forth, so that you can predict um, at different market shares and different service pricing, can this be a sustainable business? And the goal here is not to see if it can be profitable necessarily because the town doesn't have to make a profit, but you do wanna make sure it's sustainable so that you don't aren't using ongoing subsidies to support the operation of the network. Now, there, that can be a viable model. And for the island of Islesboro, that's what they're doing, is they used taxpayer funding to build the network. And they're also using some taxpayer funding to subsidize the ongoing operation of the network. And that was a conscious decision that they made. And before they kicked it off, they said, we want to make sure that this service is affordable for all citizens of the island, regardless of income. And they defined affordable as $30 a month for a full gigabit service, symmetrical. Um, and that's what they do today. The town actually sends out an invoice once a year for $360. Um, you pay it and you can keep your service. You don't pay it, they disconnect you. Um, um, and that's the, that's the service they offer. The network operator that they hired does provide voice services and other services on top of that, but the town doesn't participate in that. So this performa is sort of patterned after that, not necessarily on the uh, pricing, but all of the expenses and the operator expenses and so forth. So um, that's sort of everyone's gold standard or wish that they could be is like what Islesboro has. And they have over 90% of their subscribers using the network. There is no cable competition. There was only DSL um, and it's, it's turned out to be a very successful operation, but for their situation. And that's why I always come back to what are your goals and vision? What do you want to accomplish? And everyone says, well, we want, you know, everyone wants fiber. Okay. Do you want to own that network or do you want somebody else to own it? Um, so there's a lot of things that, you know, this financial performance should help inform you, but at the end of the day, the town still needs to make a decision. Um, so, I thought I would move on to the Q&A and, um, cursor. and see if anybody, uh, I'm assuming everyone's read through the responses to these questions. Um, does anybody have any follow-up questions um, to what I, how I answered these? Or do you want me to just walk through each one? Well, just for the sake of time, maybe if we just hit the ones that we have questions on. Um, uh, that's suggestion if that works for everyone else. That sounds good to me. Um, I think, Mo Patrick, did all of these come through from you? Uh, looking through it, I think most did. Okay. Um, so I think we're, we're, wow. When I read through the questions that were being submitted, I was like, okay, this is way over my knowledge level. And then when I read the answers, I knew it was. <laughs> Um, so I'm looking to you to um, ask Brian what we need to know about. <laughs> all right. Uh, so first of all, Brian, thank you for answering uh, all the questions. Um, 
<clears throat> some of the questions I'll be standard or, or a test of your knowledge. Um, so, really? yeah. <laughs> so, so that being said, um, I, I think overall this, uh, you know, I got a good handle on the assumptions behind the performer. I think a, as you were speaking to earlier, a lot of the details uh, for, you know, refined numbers need to come from taking the next step. But it, it, this is really helpful for me to understand that there's some really solid assumptions and, and data uh, behind the assumptions but, uh, and, and the model. But I do have a few questions, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. So, and, and Catherine, I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but the 1,331 homes, has anybody tested that against the town's uh, databases? I don't believe so. I think Eric offered up a couple different ways to do that through our TRIO tax system. Um, but we were going based on the analysis that was done for the coalition. Okay. So uh, it's just something to consider uh, because if that's off by 10 or 15%, uh, that's really going to drive the performer uh, one way or the other. And just to uh, also clarify, that would be part of the field survey effort in the engineering process right up front is to, as we're out capturing the poll data, then we also capture subscriber data. And, you know, our experiences from tax records, <laughs> You know, if if there's no structure on the property, that's an easy. Uh, there's no subscriber there. If there is a structure, is it a habitable structure or not? Is hard to determine sometimes. Um, no, you're you're absolutely right. So, but I think just you know testing the data just to see what or if there is a variance there, um, <clears throat> I think is something we should take take a look at. So. Um, which is why I posed the question. Brian Tarbuck, could you make a note of these specific questions in the notes that you're taking, please? I'll do my best. Thank you. Then I can follow up on them and get the answers back for you guys. Uh, you answered the question on the mileage estimate being road mileage. You know, I think we might want to look at maybe adding 7% to that because polls um pole lines and pass you know crisscross across streets that does add some distance and uh, you know at the assumption of uh even at twenty five thousand dollars a mile that can that can add up so that's just one thing to consider as we kind of refine that pro forma uh doesn't include service poles so uh, service poles are poles that are off the main road that to a home that, that is far enough off the road that clearances can't be kept without putting in another pole. Uh, I would say 95% of the time or greater the, the those poles are added, are owned by um, you know, the power company or, or the telephone company. So that could uh, you know, add um, to the pole rental fees, you know, however, um, your estimate of 33 poles a mile being 150 foot per span is probably short. So maybe those two will average out. Yeah. And the, uh, you know, as an example, I was uh, preparing for the meeting today. I was looking at uh, down here around the southern part of the lake. And we have following these roads down to the lake and as you really zoom in on the imagery you can start to see that there's a easement that's coming down along the lakefront um, that you would follow to serve all of this lakefront property so i i actually think the mileage um, uh, may be a little bit overstated um, with what we're representing, but to your point, you know, we don't know how many poles there are between um, this and the, the uh, subscriber addresses. Um, but uh, I think it all overall will probably balance out. Um, yeah. But it, 
Yeah, that's the beauty of the, the performer model is we can start making these, you know, adding these contingencies in or, or modifying the numbers and see how it performs. It's, it's very, very easy to do, so. Okay. So, uh, fair point. So again, you know, taking that step will refine that further. Um, you know, under the operating cost, there's just a plug of 2 k uh, $2,000 a month um, for uh, internet access. Uh, but elsewhere in the performer, it's like 6% of uh, revenue, which I think comes out to about 20, based on the $70 model, uh, comes out to about 22,000 a month. So I think that's probably more accurate than building a gig service. Yeah, um, and you know, this is a, based on quotes for other projects um, and tracking usage on other projects. Um, so, but again, it can vary. And, and I, I really, I hesitate to tie it to the monthly recurring revenue. Um, that, but that was the only way I, I really had to make sure that as you exercise the model, that you could see that increase. So for instance, if we increased this, to, you know, we started incrementing up 5% a year, um, then you can see over here that internet cost is going up. Um, so it, it's built into the model. It's not an exact science. Um, and as you get closer, you would get you would understand better how you're going to be getting back to the internet to begin with, um, and you could you know you could refine the model. So uh, you know I have a lot of notes on you know things that would really be uncovered in the in the next phase if you were to take it to the next step, but um, I think um, my biggest grandest question is in light of the fact that the town will own the OLT and the router. So OLT folks is optical line uh, termination. Um, this is what converts the electrical signal to, to light to the customer's home and, and, and back. Um, we would, would we still be restricted to one operator in light of the fact that we own that termination equipment? Could we not open it up to say all providers? And uh, yeah. providers pay the town a fee to use the network that the town funded. And they own the subscriber, they do the billing, uh, provide the services and set their own prices and everybody you know, has an equal playing field to compete. Um, is, do you see that as an option based on how the performer is structured today? Well, first of all, it, so just to back up a little bit, we refer to that as an open access network. And um, there's one example of that here in the state of Maine in the towns of Baylorville Callis uh, built an open access network. They have a network operator to operate it. That network operator is also a service provider on the network, but they're the only service provider on the network. And the cable company and the phone company have publicly refused to utilize the network. So I actually love the model, the concept. It, it you know, uh, and you have it in your town today. Your road network is an open access network. Everyone can drive their own cars on your roads. Um, your electric distribution is an open access network. Um, CMP provides the transmission and you can get your power from any number of different places. And when you're talking about networking, especially in these lower density areas, it makes all kinds of sense to only have one set of infrastructure and to allow competition across that infrastructure. The problem in Baylorville Callis is they don't have the density to attract additional service providers beyond the one that they have. So while, you know, it's still too early to say whether that's a success or not, 
thus far, it doesn't appear to be. And we haven't been able to see into the financial performer, financial performance of that network to see is that really performing or not. So there's unknowns. There's a lot of examples elsewhere in the country where those type of networks are successful, but typically they're in areas that have greater density than you have or most of Maine has. Um, the, um, there, it, it, there is another network in Maine that may become a open access network. Um, can't talk about it because I represent those towns. Um, and we'll see how it turns out, but there may be another sort of model where that could work. But again, I don't think with this low density that it really works. It might work if the six towns went together and now you've got scale. Um, and then that could overcome the density deficit in terms of the performance of the network. So we would have to model it. This Performa is set up as a single provider Performa. Um, a, it, 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 we could modify it to look at open access and then we would have to decide, define open access. Is that where you're just leasing a dark fiber to another service provider? Or so it's a dark fiber open access or is it a lit service open access where you're providing all the optical electronics and they're just interconnecting with your network and providing service over it. Um, so so there's, there's a lot of moving parts to that model. I just wanted to float the concept out there that there is an option to look at a open access where any provider can come on uh, for whatever fee, you know, the town may, uh, you know, assess on it per customer basis. And that could be $0 for that matter. I'm not saying that has to be a fee, uh, but it, it's, you know, based on the performer, there is room here to explore an open access model as well as a single provider model. Yeah, and happy to do that. It's, um, you know, but it, it's just a different set of complexities, if you will. Yeah, so it's an option with some work. Can I interrupt and, for just a and, moment? And just let me add on, those open access networks like Baileyville, Callis, you know, five years from now, consolidated communications might change their view and say, you know what, we want to use your network. We're going to decommission ours. Um, and the cable companies, you know, their mindsets could change. Yeah. All that we can operate on today is what they're saying is that they're not changing, but it could. Um, so, I wish I had a clear crystal ball. I'm sorry, Kathy. No, that's okay. But you mentioned something that I'd like Brian Tarbuck. I think, Brian, you were the one who listened in on Angus King's call today. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and Brian, you, Brian Lippold, you just mentioned something about if the, co if the towns went together as a coalition, we might have uh, a, an opportunity for different options. And Brian, you mentioned that in your brief email today. Could you just talk about that to the group here? Yeah, but, uh, sort of in short, it seems like Reedfield is doing in the, the Western Kennebec Lakes Coalition, I don't know what exactly it's called, is doing all the right things by doing some preliminary work to try to tee up some thoughts about what a build out of a network might look like. And from what Senator King was saying, he said, there's kinds of things that will set, you know, some communities apart from others who are a little behind the eight ball. So that was, that was encouraging. There's something like, th I want to say there's 34 million or something that exists today. Um, Brian, you'll, you'll know more about that than I will. That was budgeted or, or passed for expanding Maine's broadband access recently. May I've heard like 34 million or 10 million, one of the two. Well, here, get out your calculator. Um, so <laughs> this last June, they passed a $15 million bond uh, for broadband. 
and the first tranche of that is open right now. They're they're estimating that it'll probably be around seven and a half million or half of that 15 million that'll go out in this round. They're suggesting that there will likely be another round beginning in July for the other seven and a half million. There is uh, the governor has proposed a new $30 million bond bill for the election in November. Um, and the Republican delegation has proposed a $100 million bond bill uh, for November. Um, and the belief is, is that it'll end up somewhere between the two and probably closer to 30 than 100. But um, it, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's got support on both sides of the aisle at this point. Um, on the, from the federal side, um, the American Recovery Act, is that what we're calling this now? Or it's not like the new legislation they just passed in DC um, could potentially have, I've heard anywhere from 30 to 130 million coming to Maine for broadband, which would go into the Connect Maine Authority. Um, there's 10 million um, that comes in for the communities that host the NEC EC power corridor if that project uh, comes to fruition. So you got the 15, you got the 10, so now you're at 25, you got, let's call it 30, you're at, at uh, seven, it's 55, and another 30 to 100 from the feds. You're looking at it over $100 million. Um, for broadband here pretty quick. It's not clear how they're going to allocate that funding. Today, the state of Maine says we'll only fund those areas with current speeds of less than 25 over three, which means that they won't fund anything where there's an existing cable TV infrastructure. But there's also discussion about changing that threshold and funding anything where it uh, 100 over 100 isn't available, which means that then you're funding everywhere that doesn't have fiber to the home. Um, but then if they do that, are they still going to focus on the more poorly served areas or will those dollars then go to Southern Maine? Um, that, so it's all over the board. Yeah. Yeah, Angus, Angus was saying, the numbers he was saying that he expected out of the federal share was not 30, but closer to 110 to 130. He kept saying 130 over and over. He's, he's a politician, so he's going to tell us what we want to hear, right? But um, still, it seemed, it seemed encouraging. I mean, it seems like there's going to be so much demand all of a sudden. Do, does Maine even have the capacity to build this out, I guess? And it would seem like maybe not. Uh, it's going to be an awful lot of, awful lot of push, especially if you're getting a year, you know, you're a year out to just get back, a year back from a cable well, company, you know. I, I think the capacity exists to construct and fill these gaps over the next three years. Um, it is a question as to whether or not the state of Maine has the capacity to manage the, the distribution of those funds. Um, we'll see. But I can tell you that um, I'm in the midst of working on grant projects for this upcoming round that will have an impact in 30 different communities. Um, and, um, and I'm not, you know, doing all the work in Maine. Um, so there's going to be a lot of grant applications coming in. Um, that are quote unquote shovel ready. And um, they're just waiting on the final funding piece to kick off the project. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of activity going on. I so, can give you folks an update on what we do know currently. Um, this was put out through Maine Municipal last week. There was a pot of money that's coming out of this latest stimulus bill. Um, and it was divided up to certain broad 
large communities. There were maybe six or seven in the state. And then it, there's another pot that went to counties and then a certain amount is going to every town in Maine based on population. And Reedfield's share is 260,000. Um, so we're going to be getting that from the federal government and it it does have stipulations it has to be used for um new things it can't be it can't be used to reduce your tax burden <laughs> and it's supposed to be something that helps out due to the pandemic um, so it would seem that that would be an amazing use of that money to go towards whatever we decide to do with broadband um, and my guess is since that's the way this got distributed, there's probably going to be a like distribu distribution of part of the monies that will be coming forth where they will try to give it equally to towns as well as put it out for grants. Um, that just seems to be what the, the thinking is right now from Maine Municipal. So that, that's all we know for certain. It just doesn't seem like a bad problem to have. But uh, I guess, you know, Brian and uh, Patrick from you guys doing this all the time, you know, where do you think we should, where do you think we should stake our claim here? I mean, the, the financially prudent one seems to be, let's just get the cable company to build out that last mile bit and be done with it. And then, then we're, we could pay cash for that. It won't cost the town anything. We're getting federal funds to do it and just get in the line. Um, unless something really crazy happens with these completely unserved communities that we're part of in that six community group that makes it a no brainer to build out fiber everywhere. But it just seems unlikely at, at best. And I, I think someone said that if cable's in town, it's pretty hard to beat them as much as we might like to. Um, well, um, I mean, I guess, I guess I, let, me, a yeah, let, let me clarify what I said. Yeah, go ahead. You can achieve at least a 40% market share in competition with cable. Um, and that's been demonstrated time and time again. Um, so you can compete with them. The question is, is do you want to? Um, but you, you can compete with them. Um, but you know, it costs money. But my only interest in that is if, as you know, we started off about an hour ago with Patrick talking about the franchise agreement, but then we discovered that's really just pertaining to cable. But if we could at least get the network map from Charter to see what there is for cable internet, um, and we could actually get that equally to all locations, then it would be worth maybe putting that quarter million into expansion to finish off the town. But if there's no regulation that requires them to make sure that they're getting service to everyone, then it's kind of like, to me, it seems like we're just throwing money down the drain. So I, I don't know how we the, juggle that. And, and you know, while they, the franchise agreement and everything is specific to cable TV, they know you're really talking about internet. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that. They, they, they know that. Um, you just can't really say it um, yeah. through the franchise uh, process. But the other thing none of that solves is for those homes that have long driveways and the cable company will only build out 150 feet. So many of your subscribers, potential subscribers that aren't utilizing uh, the cable system today aren't doing it because it costs too much to extend service down their long driveway. Um, uh, the way that um, most of the communities that are building out deal with that is if you sign up for service, they call it a pre-subscription. If you sign up for service before construction starts, you get a free connection. In other words, it, it's the, it, it costs less to run that down to those long driveways if you're doing that 
when you're building the overall network. So it's just one big, large effort. You got multiple construction crews out there. Um, you know, the management of it all is much more efficient. Again, there's scale. And then for those subscribers that don't sign up during that pre-subscription or, or by the time construction is complete, then they're on their own to get that, uh, that long driveway paid for. Um, so how did those folks side, with the long driveway get power? They paid for that. Right. So any home that's there, there are going to be poles to that, to that house, right? Yeah, but you still have to run it down there. Um, and with the run cable the, run the, yeah. It's a different gotcha. type of cable um, that they use for the drop as opposed to, there's, there's yeah. different uh, specifications, but. So, so the poles are there, but the, the wiring for cable may right. not be. Right. And if it's underground and they did not um, end with an uh, you know, additional conduit, uh, that can get really expensive. Yeah, in that, in all of the other projects, if they need an additional conduit, that's always up to the subscriber. So you got to you got to provide a path for the new cable um, coming in. As you do your water line, your power line, right. so it's no different. But and and subscribers, a homeowner's mind, they when they look at cable TV or internet, they tend to you know push back on on that cost unless they really need. And again, all the work from home and COVID has really driven that pendulum in the opposite way. It, it, it's a way to solve, or it's a way to mitigate, not completely solve, but to mitigate the equity issue. Um, and it's real easy for me to say, hey, you chose to you know, have a, a, a driveway that's 2,000 feet long. Um, it interestingly, and I, I run into this a lot, the reality is, is, well, they didn't choose it. They inherited that house. It was passed down from mom and dad. They don't have the income like to, to afford to extend it down there. So they, they, they're, not, they're not financially able. Um, so if you were to build your own network, that's a way to address that equity issue. Um, and in the case of Islesboro, that's what they did. Um, and they tell new subscribers, look, we'll cover the first $500. After that, you have to cover everything. Um, there's different ways to go about it. So if- So Brian, back to your question, uh, just to suggest you where we go next. Um, I would like to suggest that as a committee, we regroup and look at different models and the pros and cons and the cost as you know, we know today in the performer and, and as, a as a committee decide, you know, what, what is the right step? I think Brian has given us some really good background here. Um, I just think we need to do a side-by-side -side comparison of, of the options. Just, just a suggestion. Yeah. What, what do you see as those options? Uh, well, I think um, leaving rural broadband funding aside, because it doesn't sound like we know enough about it to really uh, you know, put stake in it, but um, you know, contributing to uh, some of the costs to have uh, spectrum extended plant, um, pros and cons of a single provider uh, you know type model versus an open network um, you know, uh, model um, and then I, I still think we need to look at some of the a little bit of the competitive analysis just so we know what we're up against you know for instance FYI spectrum is pointing on double doubling their speeds at their current rates so that steps up uh, the, the benchmark for what we'd have to compete against. What, when it's coming to retail, I, I don't know, but that's where they're going. Um, so we've got to take all those things into consideration and say, okay, what what is the next best step? Well, maybe there's two, but um, I think uh, we got to weigh all options. 
at least walk through them. I know one thing that came up from a couple people who have been in touch with Eric, especially, um, is that the schools are all getting an, in, an increase in their, okay, not all the schools, but many. And I was that on this committee last time? I think Brian Tarbuck, you shared that map with us. I still have it up. Yeah, that's correct. So if the schools are getting increased capacity and faster speeds, does that translate to they are putting in more lines or better service to our towns? Most of the schools are connected to the MSLN network with dark fiber. And it was lit at either 100 megabit or 500 megabit. Some of them were lit at, at a gig. So the main school library network has gone through and essentially turned the dial to increase the speed over that dark fiber. Um, so, um, which was a good thing, um, but there was no new infrastructure deployed. Um, they, they put out that out to bid every three years and all the providers bid on it every three years. And each year they get more and more dark fiber, um, uh, instead of a, uh, a specific speed type service. So, um, that, that's what they did. That's. So does that mean that we have fiber running through Reed Field? Hold on. You've got, uh, I'll, I'll share my screen again. I guess that would help. Um, and if it is, can we connect to that? Or can someone build off of that for us? Well, um, I'm going to show you the apologize for the color there. Can you see the purple? Yes. Yep. Okay. That's consolidated communications fiber. So, you know, you can, if you're a, let me back up. This fiber was put in for three primary reasons. Um, one, to go from central office to central office, sort of from town to town, and then to connect to remote terminals for DSL, to connect to cell towers, and to connect to large institutional or business customers. Some of this fiber was deployed back in the 80s. Um, and it doesn't have a lot of fibers in the cable or the fiber, uh, the, the characteristics of it aren't capable of handing, handling some higher speeds, but a lot of it's usable. Um, the consolidated doesn't sell anybody dark fiber. They don't like doing that, um, but they would use that fiber to enable fiber to the home nodes where they would you know, drop a node um, every half a mile or something or, or further depending on the density and they would um, build off of that to serve fiber to the home. Um, uh, consolidated uh, recently got a cash infusion from a private equity firm of $450 million um, that they're using to build out fiber to the home. Um, and I believe in Maine, they're gonna build out to over 400,000 homes uh, with fiber. But most of that is gonna be in Southern Maine where there's density and they're gonna be competing with the cable company. Um, so I don't think that's gonna to come to Reed Field um, anytime soon. Um, but so that infrastructure could be used in that manner. Would that help Fayette, Brian? I mean, is that infrastructure going through Fayette? Because that would be a no brainer kind of. Uh, yeah, Fayette has less density than you do um so you know same situation potentially um don't know it's just interesting because 
you know, you could say, well, if a town bought out consolidated its fiber, so then they all, all they had to do is just kind of ride the town's lightning. They didn't have to deal with it anymore. There could be some really weird hybridized uh, markets going on here in the, the near future. It's pretty interesting. We, uh, when we did the Islesboro project, uh, we negotiated to buy the Fairpoint infrastructure on the island. Um, and we reached, we had a term sheet and it was very, um, it, it was modestly priced. It was essentially half of what the make ready costs would be on the island. Um, and at the last minute, the town backed out of the deal. Um, and we were going to use it just to overlash new fiber instead of going through the make ready process. So they, they're willing to sell assets. Um, but in Reedfield, you wouldn't be competing against consolidated. You're competing against the cable company, to be clear. So but to Brian's point, and back to the open network, consolidated might look at, particularly for rural areas where there's lower density, that leasing capacity, say from a town network, is more cost effective to them than building that whole infrastructure themselves from scratch. So and maintaining it. Yeah, and maintaining it. So, uh, you know, to your point, Brian, the dynamics are constantly changing here and probably have changed more in the last 12 months than I've seen in the last 20 years. But um, that's why I think we ought to just at least whiteboard all the models so that when, I, I don't know where it goes next from this committee, but whomever we present it to or whatever, uh, you know, options uh, we bring forward to educate those making uh, the decision that could just, you know, it's be uh, as simple as the actual residents. We want to make sure that we lay out all options in, in, in front of them so they fully understand it. And who would be, is that something that you would want this committee to do? Is that something you have the knowledge to do? Is that something we need to hire Casco Bay to do? Um, I think I could put something together um, and that's what I was suggesting. Maybe we meet as a committee and I'll just, you know, lay out, uh, you know, the pros and cons that I see of each model. And then maybe Brian can, you know, do a run through it and give it straight face step test and, uh, you know, add any, you know, color to it. Um, but, you know, keep it straight and honest, uh, you know, might save on, you know, time and cost. And so that would be to, I just want to be clear, that would be to finish out our cable network on those light green lines. Being one option, yes. Okay. And then would I, it seems if we wanted to really address the equity issue, we would have to include the drops to those long driveways if that's what people wanted. Because that's what we would be looking at in a fiber network is going to their homes. So I'd want to keep the, the parameters equal. Right. Yep. Agreed. If you want to have a couple of minutes and they have to have use the same variables. Right. Yep. I see a lot of value in doing that exercise. Um, we know we're not doing anything in terms of going to the voters um, until at least November and most likely next June. You know, if this committee came up with something and we said, well, you know, we have this $260,000 that's come from the federal government and we've said that we need to do this study or we need to go in this direction. What do you people think? Um, we could do that in November or we can do it next June um, or we can wait and see how the world changes and develops. But while we do that, we have to understand that we have people who are completely underserved, who are still screaming, I want something. <laughs> um, so no, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. And I, I don't want to give up on the uh, franchise agreement as far as engineering study. And I know the franchise agreement is video only, but there's some nuances to that. Video is a two-way service. Internet is a two-way service. So if there's something going on in the network that is impacting uh, the internet service, chances are it's impacting the video service too. So um, I, I just don't want to lose, lose track of that. I know that's a, you know, kind of a parallel side rail, if you will. 
but if there's customers out there having, uh, or residents out there having, you know, some serious problems with their service, uh, I still think there might be something we can do to uh, help move that process along. Is that something you could help Eric with in terms of negotiating, getting that study out of spectrum? Okay. That's an interesting perspective. I hadn't really thought about that approach. I, I missed the earlier discussion on it, but um, yeah, I, I know that uh, Spectrum is, uh, you know, they, they have the information. So if we, we have a right to ask for it under, under certain terms, I think. So yeah, I think we should pursue that. Yeah. What they can do is say no, and we can make you know, a better case. Of, and anyway, we, we, take, we take the video approach, but fully understanding that, uh, you know, one, one, one impacts the other, if you will. Uh, so, but I would need, you know, what, what I what I have on my plate. I don't know when you want to meet next, but you know, give me three or four weeks to pull something together. If I can pull something together sooner, at least for the committee to start discussing. I mean, it's not going to be a final, uh, you know, product, but walk through it, you know, tweak it, get everybody's input, um, answer questions, and get to a point where we can take it to Brian and say. Uh, you know, if you want to take that step, uh, because I know the costs associated with that, uh, and have him, you know, do a, a once or twice over on it, um, just to make sure it's pretty well buttoned up. Do we have money currently, Eric, that we can do that in this fiscal year, or does that have to wait till July? We have select board contingency available that we could use. Okay, and I think the select board would be willing to do that so that we could keep rolling. Um, I think it's really good for us to keep going and to have the best analysis possible, given what Brian heard Senator King say today um, about towns that are already working on things are more likely to be farther along in the game when the funding comes available. Um, in the more analysis we have and can give to the residents of the town, uh, well, not just the residents, but the property owners. Uh, I, I think it makes a case for us getting closer to the head of the line instead of being farther back in the pack and waiting longer for which, whatever direction we take. Yeah. Um, it's sounding like somebody wants us to have a meeting in maybe a month and then a, a couple weeks or two more weeks after that. Okay, that would be the 14th of April. April. Eric, how does that look on your calendar? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty flexible. I, I mean, <laughs> uh, budget season's getting close to being done, so um, I'll have a little bit more room. Um, let me double check really quick here. Patrick, would that work for you? Yeah, I was just going to say being um, birthday and uh, wedding anniversary, I'm going to have to last week. Did you say that's a birthday and wedding anniversary? All right. Well, we're not doing it then. Yeah, when I go, when I go, I go big. Um, <laughs> we'll just we, we can do it the week before or the week after. Yeah, do the week before. before. I don't think it will take me that long. I, I just don't want to overpromise. So that would be the seventh. That looks good on my calendar. Let me double check the uh, town. Um, the uh, planning board recently moved from Wednesday evenings to Tuesday, so that certainly helps things out a bit. And then do we want to set another meeting um, with Brian now so that we can get on his calendar or his dance card? Well, if we did the uh, 7th and the 21st, I could try that maybe. Let me check get to April. Although Brian um, Lippold, if you were to hear from us, is two weeks enough time to do an analysis of what we give you or would you need longer? <laughs> I, I will uh, do my best to fit it in, but without seeing what you're asking for, it's hard for me to answer that question. Well, so we have a comprehensive plan meeting again uh, on the 21st. So I'll, I'll say maybe we could go uh, the, the uh, 7th and the 28th. I'll, uh, on the 7th, 
Um, I'm at 545 that evening. I'm getting my second shot and I'm not going to change that. No, and I think <laughs> I think the idea was to not have you at that meeting. Ah, all right. Um, yep. Not that we don't want your input, but I don't want to pay you if we don't have to. <laughs> oh, come on, I'm cheap. I... I'm very honest. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, well, that's me. Um, so and I'll then, propose that. <laughs> and then if we if we get that to you and three weeks looks good, we can look at the 28th tentatively as our next meeting. And if you get whatever we give to you and you're like, okay, can't possibly happen, then we could reschedule. Would that work for folks? That's fine with me. Yeah, and, one's pretty open. I mean, and if there's uh, things you want to do with the performa, I can spin that stuff out pretty quick for you in the interim. So if you want to look at some different what ifs or whatever, um, just let me know. Are we all set with Brian? Any more questions or comments for him at this point? Actually, I have one question. Uh, Brian, where do you see uh, Starlink or the you know Amazon uh, alternative to that with the satellite internet? Where do you see that coming in in terms of competing with fiber to the home or cable? Um, it remains to be seen. What we know right now is that it's in a beta environment. Um, it's not fully baked. Um, um, I've got a, a number of, uh, uh, well, I've got one municipal client that's working directly with SpaceX to support some uh, people in their community. Some of those people um, have sent the devices back because they just can't deal with all of the service interruptions, but it's a beta. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to improve. The price is high, both for the installation and for the monthly charge. Um, will those prices come down over time? Don't know. Um, and there's also, as I understand it, other limitations as to the number of potential subscribers they can have within a geographic area. So I think it's gonna be a, a phenomenal solution for really rural areas. Um, um, uh, it'll be, it, it, it can fill in, you know, you will look at town of Reedfield and those unserved areas, potentially those could be filled in with Starlink. But as I understand it, it's not a community-wide solution for anyone. Yeah. Um, so it would more compete with something like a HughesNet or something like that? No, well, it, yeah, it'll blow HughesNet out of the water. Um, uh, so it, it's 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 a competitive service, but it, it wouldn't Again, as I understand it, and it's still evolving, it, it wouldn't be a solution for a community wide. Yep. Thank you. All right. So I think I was being asked to drop off. So I'm going to do that. And I just wanted to make sure everybody had their questions thrown out there and they were answered. All right. Um, and Patrick, do you have my contact information? Uh, is it on any of the documents? I'll, I'll shoot you an email. Uh, I, I would like to talk to you, um, uh, not particularly about this project, uh, but uh, something else that I think we have in common. So, Okay. Uh, All right. Sounds good. I'll shoot you an email. Very good. Thank you, Brian. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Brian. Thanks a lot, Brian. Very helpful. Good. Thank you. Uh, the next item was communication efforts. That's Catherine. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I asked Eric 
okay, what am I supposed to talk about here? But um, I think it's important to keep the public um, apprised of the fact that this is an issue that it's in, well, I think every, pretty much everybody knows that it's in the news almost daily nowadays, especially in central Maine. Um, but to keep Reedfield residents um, aware, we have our monthly newsletter um, that goes out the Reedfield Messenger and it goes out uh, to people who subscribe. It's on the web page, and we also have paper copies that we put around town. Um, so I intend to keep writing something each month about that. And I thought what I would do is try and give a not too detailed, but kind of a middle level detail um, about what we do in our committee meetings each month, you know, what the topics were we discussed and the types of questions that we had in the direction we're looking to try and answer those. Um, and was looking for some feedback if you guys think that that's a worthwhile approach or do you have a better suggestion? I think that's good. Definitely gotta keep them posted on what we're doing here. That way they're not blind at the polls when we find to that point. Yeah, agreed. Upstream communication, side stream, downstream, every stream. <laughs> um, and I think I had mentioned earlier, because Brian asked at the beginning of our meeting, Eric, if Brian Lippold, um, if this was going to be recorded and would it be out there for the public? And I said, well, I think so. So let's talk like it would be. Um, but I mentioned that you and I had just recently talked about making a, a broadband page on the town website. So people who are interested could just go there instead of having to search through for pieces here and there. Um, so I, I think that would be worthwhile, make it more accessible to people. Um, and then another thing that yeah. I, I don't know how we do this, um, but I think it would be really useful if we could get an email for everyone in town who has one. Some people are really reluctant to give an email because they don't want to get junk. Um, and they only want to get stuff that they ask for. Um, but it, it's so hard to communicate with everyone in town um, to say, hey, you know, we're looking at this project. It might be a $300,000 project or it might be a $4 million project. Um, and we want to keep getting input um, because there's no point in, you know, even if we feel that the build out of the cable internet is worthwhile, if we get almost no support from the voters because they really want to do the broadband on fiber um, or vice versa, it, it would be helpful to know more before we actually put it to referendum. Um, and so I just don't know how to collect that. If that's something we go kind of door to door or we ask people in neighborhoods, if we do more uh, direct mailing, Eric, I think we put in, was it a total of 9,000 into next year's budget to help us with our efforts as a committee? We, yeah, that's correct. And it was roughly split. I think it was 5,000 for consulting, 4,000 for outreach efforts to include things like mailings and, uh, uh, and that. Uh, so, uh, but then again, um, you know, it's, it's flexible between those two categories. So we, yeah, 9,000 was the number. Uh, plus the board does have, have a contingency that you could use for special things like this, um, which the board has been very good about doing, doing that responsibly. Uh, but being a, time sensitive matter and a priority for the community. I think that um, you, you have certainly the 9,000 at a minimum and, and probably more. And just so that we are all aware um, and it, it, it needs to just go through Eric, of course, but um, right now the current rate for Casco Bay is $175 an hour. Um, so when we have a two hour meeting, there pops off um, what 350 bucks okay. and of course, if there's prep time or redoing the performa, that's being charged out also. So I, you know, we, we cert, we're looking at spending a lot of money. So we need to do all of our due diligence and we have to pay for it. And that's not an issue, but I'd like us to be as streamlined as possible. So when we ask him something, he can do the most in the least amount of time. Yeah. Um, great. I think it's great too. Yeah, I, I wanna make sure we use Patrick, but don't burn him out, so. <laughs> right. So question um, on, on collecting uh, email. You mentioned um, website, the town's website. I, I don't know what the website development um, 
resource is, but um, if we put a link on the town website, is it someone that could develop a uh, interface for people that want to be kept informed to supply them, volunteer the email address so that they would be on a, you know, you know any kind of email communication regarding broadband? That's one way to collect it. Um, we have that capability now, right, Eric? We do right now. It's um, the, the categories for uh, selection are recreation, uh, select board, planning board, and one other. But we could add, I think, pretty easily a, a, a choice for, oh, and bids and RFPs. We could add a choice for um, exclusively broadband and internet type uh, activities. How's the subscription, subscription levels for all those other options that are currently out there? You get a lot of people that... You know, click on keep me informed and add their email address. We have a fair response rate. Uh, it's been probably a year since I've looked at the actual spreadsheet of, of because it basically gets cataloged uh, on the uh, website. And um, I'll, I'll look at that and see what we have for a subscription base. But I, I know it's several hundred anyway. We, we have a pretty good, pretty good base. Oh, Eric, there was another question um, earlier about the number of households. I think, Patrick, the number you gave us was 1331. Uh, that's what's in the pro forma on the town's website. It, I think it was right around just under 1,000. Uh, but again, I don't know if that was dwellings uh, when you factor in multiple dwelling units. Um, but just, just based on you know how Brian, uh, his methodology to get to that number, which is you know fairly sound, um, just thought I'd check it against the town you know, data and records. Right. Yeah. So when we're talking reaching out to people, it, it's hard because, say, there are three people in my household who might subscribe. So you'd have three separate email addresses, but we're representing one residence. So really one subscriber to a network. Um, and so how do we how do we figure out how many actual people so if you have 250 people saying, I want to get broadband information, are we reaching a quarter of the households? We've got 2,800 people in town. I'm not sure how we distinguish. Yeah, I, I'll go ahead and just clarify. I wasn't suggesting the website um, you know, link as, as a way of assessing the number of dwellings in town. That was uh, right. just about how, do, how can we communicate that's kind of a zero cost or near zero cost uh, approach. But as far as the number of dwellings in, in town, um, you know, 1,331, I think is in the pro forma if the town has different records. If that's off by 10%, that significantly changes the operating model. So we just, I just think we ought to check that number. Eric, didn't you say that we could check possibly through TRIO? Yeah, um, and, and so I guess, um, I, I was trying to remember where I had done this, but um, I had gone through this exercise a little bit with some of the Western Kennebec Lakes folks uh, on and trying to help them find out and verify their their numbers. Um, I think with that group, one of their biggest concerns was the differentiation between seasonal residences and year round residences, because they Fayette, Wayne, Mount Vernon have uh, Vienna have much a higher percentage of seasonal population than we do you know as, as a percentage of their of their population so they were worried about the the take rate for that class of, of, of resident um, but uh, with, with us we have less but still uh, the one thing that I um, or the two things that I did to look at our numbers um, because we we send mailings out pretty regularly we look at um, motor vehicle registrations uh, and and voter registrations uh, and those two things, uh, when, you, when you look at them, uh, give you slightly different numbers. But if you take those full lists and then break it out and take out the duplicate households, uh, that's a pretty good way. If those addresses are, are duplicate, they go away. Um, we get between, I, th I think, 12 to 1,400. It's, it's right in that range uh, okay. as far as addresses for voting and um, 
motor vehicles, motor vehicles being the one that I think is most reliable because there isn't a home in Reedfield that's, that's occupied uh, year round that doesn't have a drive or uh, doesn't have a vehicle in it. So if we can go through and parse that out, which we've done, uh, and that's actually how we get our addresses for some of our mailing lists, um, we, we come in right in that range. So I think 1200 to 1300 is, is um, you know, probably very close for a, a year round type um, number. Um, and then you add a few more, uh, you know, a couple hundred more for, um, for seasonal. So. Yeah, that's a pretty good litmus test. So yeah, um, sounds like it's in the ballpark. Yeah, it is. I mean, if we decide to proceed with this, I definitely want to make sure that we, we nail it down and do some, you know, another round of analytics on it. But uh, we have the tools, I think, to come to come within a couple percentage points of, of what the real number is. Yeah, but it sounds like for now, at least the level of the, of the performer stage that we're in, that uh, you know, the numbers are significantly different. So. Yeah, they are. But I, I do worry a little bit about those summer residents and whether they would be interested in, in subscribing to this. Um, they would be paying taxes on it if it was part of the tax base model that we were looking at. Um, but, you know, one of the things I've heard is that a lot of these folks that are living on the lakes now want to have internet year round because they have security cameras, they have temperature sensors, they have all these things that are connected uh, and they want to maintain that. So that's a question I want to get more information on. Yeah. Yeah. Check the box, uh, you know, I'm one of those, right? <laughs> yep. Um, I, another idea that I had was, would we as a group, this group of us, um, want to put together another questionnaire or poll um, that we could put out and provide to the voters for the June town meeting. Now, Eric, I think said that we had about 60%. I can't remember, Eric, how many in-person voters did we have in November? Was it about 40% oh, of the total? Well, so November was 75% uh, um, November was, uh, 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 absentee, 25% in person. The, the March um, town the meeting that we just had to elect the special Senate district or whatever it was, that was 60% in person, 40% remote. So even with COVID just starting to be, I don't want to say managed, but uh, we're, we're on the tail end of this, I think. And uh, the voting pattern has tra changed drastically from the peak uh, this, this past summer or spring. So my thought my idea thought um, was that if we put something out, it can be on a table. We can't mail it out with absentee ballots because there's a mix of regulation there. Um, but if you had something there that people could pick up, mark and leave off, there's no mailing involved. And you have people who are obviously already concerned with issues um, because they're showing up to vote. Um, and of course those could be given out we could mail them to other folks. People could take them for other folks to return. Um, but it might be a chance, it would be a chance for us to get more data if we thought there was something useful to collect. How about the uh, transfer station? Seems like that's where I see everybody. Yes, and actually all three towns um, are part of the coalition. So it, it, we could give it out to anybody who came there. And now that now that you have to stop and declare your your uh, recycling and trash ahead of time, they're getting sick of me saying I got more plutonium in the back, but they never. <laughs> on them, the thing's glowing. I out. told them to shake you down pretty good, so you know at least they're following directions. But you know, we, if you've got you've got some time and just say, hey, not for nothing, we're trying to save costs on mailing and stuff. You you have a couple, quick question about uh, broadband. We're moving forward on that. Just so you, you know takes like two seconds, I don't know. No, it's a great idea. Yeah. We could put a drop yeah. box there so that people don't, no one's collecting it, no one's touching and so on. And if they don't want it, they can just recycle it right away. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But uh, Catherine, I do like your idea about the election uh, or the um, the town meeting, because you know, if we're looking at, not that they're the only ones that matter, but they're the ones that whose, whose votes count are the, the voters. If we're looking at likely voters, um, having something at the polls uh, and, and sent to people that, that you know, do request absentee, we could always take the list of people who request absentee ballots and send them something independently. So I think that we could do both of those things and that would 
catch a lot of our likely our likely voters who would come back in in, in June of 2022 2022 yeah I hadn't thought of that twist but I really like that um, send it in a separate mailing to those who request an absentee and have it at the polls for others um, so we need to um, get that together by May. So if anybody wants to be thinking about that, I can develop something with Eric and get it out to you guys and you can add to it or say, why would you ask that? Delete things, doesn't matter. <laughs> if that sounds good. Yeah. So that's all I have on communication. Um, one other thing on that, Catherine, I think um, just, just uh, quickly, um, we do, uh, we, we had, um, done the online survey through SurveyMonkey, uh, but that was through the town of Wayne's account. Uh, I, I think it probably would be worthwhile for the town of Reedfield to get our own account um, and to, um, to do this as a multimedia type platform. The, the one challenge though, is you could get duplicates, um, but yeah, we'd have to find a way to think about accounting for that, but um, it would make it the broadest possible outreach to have all those things happening at once. Well, I think you put a question at the top or a statement at the top, you know, please only fill this out in one mm. venue um, because we're trying to get an accurate feed or, or an accurate response. You get, yeah, okay, that's a good, get IP addresses back with that. So <laughs> that may help. Yeah, I, was thinking, I think you get IP addresses so you can match those up and see if there's any duplicates. Yeah. I was thinking more between the paper copies and the online oh, version, but but that's, yeah, it's probably a minuscule issue, so I won't. I mean, worry we about could it. we could ask. I mean, maybe a very worthwhile question is, you know, is there anyone else in your household who will fill out a survey, the same survey, or we could ask people to provide their email address to keep them informed, which would still be voluntary, but at least we could start cross referencing some things that way. So. Yeah, well, I think we got about 100 or 150 email addresses from the last survey. Um, so that was really good uh, to get that start. And those folks definitely are, are actively interested. Uh, and it was a mixed, uh, you know, a mixed bag. I mean, some people were interested because they didn't want a penny of tax dollars to go into it. And some people just said, I don't care what it costs. I don't have anything. So um, I think we are getting a broad representation already. And I, I, I agree that we definitely want to increase that however we can. So I'll, I'll look at adding that checkbox to the town website uh, for the, um, the subscriber lists. Uh, and that should help draw in even more. And we can direct people every time we send out a publication or even the stuff at the transfer station, uh, we can direct people to the website to sign up and to get, get emails. So I think that, that um, that's really important, Catherine. Great. Thank you, Dan. No problem. Uh, is there anything else anybody wants to bring up or discuss on this? Or I was told yeah. there was going to be green beer, and I haven't seen any yet. <laughs> can't see my hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm married to a half-Irish woman, so I'm in trouble today from being on this. <laughs> uh-uh. Well, it, it is about uh, 8.30, so. Um... <laughs> right on time. Yeah. Yeah. So if everybody's on. Uh, on board, we can adjourn. I don't know if we need to make a motion or if we just adjourn. Now we're good. Okay. Thanks everyone. I really appreciate all your input. All right, we'll get something to you as soon as I can. Okay, folks. Thanks. All right, thank you. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Great. Right, Happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. You too.